The 360 on Energy and Carbon, hosted by 360 Energy. 360 Energy is a North American leader in energy and carbon reduction. Recently, we have launched the 360 Carbon Excellence Program, designed to make corporate climate change actions more effective and successful. For more information, check the link in our podcast description. Welcome back, Dave and John. Well, thank you, Lysandra. Nice to be here. Uh, John, I beat you to the punch. Your turn. Yes. I think we ought to have a regular competition to see who can get in to say, it's good to be back first. <laughs> we should start alternating every other week. I think yeah. so. Let's plan that and let's see if people pick this up next time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So today we're talking about distributed energy resource basics. So oftentimes in this episode, you might hear us say DER, and that's just the abbreviation of the word distributed energy resources. And I'm going to send this over to Dave to ask the question this week. Well, thank you, Lysandra. And listen, we're turning this upside down because Lysandra normally asks the questions. But Lysandra, as you're going to experience or hear, she has a lot of experience in this topic. And I'm very keen to ask the questions because I just came back from a conference on net zero. And one of the topics was on electrification. And in Canada, we're in certain provinces, we're going to have to, if we're going to get to net zero, one of the solutions is to get to, to electrify, and that means doubling our grid, our generation. And I personally think the way things are set up right now, using the traditional model, it's not going to work. We're going to have to rely on DER, our distributed energy resources, as Lysandra has talked about. So this topic is really timely, and I'm hopeful our listeners, well, I know you're going to pick up quite a bit here. So the first question is, what is distributed energy resources? I'm going to step in here and I'm actually going to say I want to talk a bit of history. And I think it's relevant because think back, we're often told that the problems we got with climate change and everything else, you know, were kicked off by the industrial revolution. And it's worth thinking about that. And you're, this will all converge into the right place, I promise you. But if you imagine before the industrial revolution, did we have energy systems? We didn't really. We, we relied on charcoal, wood, maybe some other things for, for our, our energy. We may have had um, tallow for candles. We didn't have an energy network. We started to develop industry. And what happened with the first industries that developed? They needed motive power. And how did they solve this? They initially built near an appropriate water course where they could get water power. And so not electricity generation as such, you would have a water wheel generating directly mechanical power that you could use in a mill, a factory or whatever. And so you had a distributed energy resource. Each factory had its own power plant. We then moved on a little bit and we had the steam engine and people then would have a steam engine at a factory or a plant to drive that locality. And so on it moved. And I can remember talking to my grandfather, who was a, an electrical engineer, and a part of his career was going around in England to country houses and installing generating plants so that the landed gentry could be the first to say they had electric light. So we had that. And so arguably, at the beginning of the Industrial Re Revolution, we had distributed energy resources. So why did we move away from it? Well, it was a matter of economy of scale. People suddenly realized, well, wait a minute, you know, if we generate, if we had a bigger power plant, we could distribute the energy. So we ended up having city power plants. And interestingly enough, when I visited Russia in the mid nineties, you could go into the middle of a city and there was a power plant, generating plant in the city that was generating power and sometimes distributing heat within the city. But then we got to things like nuclear power and other bigger power stations. You didn't really want to put them in the center of a populated area. So you place those in an area where they were close to a resource, typically cooling water. So what do we do? We now end up generating electricity on a really large scale and distributing it from that node point around and to everywhere we go. So that's the model that we walked in with. Now we're saying, 
heck, we need more electricity. And I think for the purposes of the podcast, we think of distributed energy resources as being about electricity generation rather than heat and mechanical power, although they could be. So we need more of it. We need more low carbon. And it turns out that very often low carbon generation is small scale or a smaller scale. And it's something that you can put here, there and everywhere. So now we're heading towards a new model of distributed energy, which presents us with an interesting problem. And I actually am not going to talk about it, but it presents us with an interesting problem of having had a grid. And this is the same for most all industrialized countries, having had a grid where we're based on these big power generating nodes and distributing power outwards. We've now got to look at a model where we've got distributed uh, power generation that's trying to feed into this grid. And therein lies a problem for us. So, Lysandra, you have been involved in examining or evaluating distributed energy resources because you and 360 Energy and the University of Windsor with the ISO were evaluating DER because there's an area in Ontario that demands significant amount of power and the availability of getting that power there has been challenging and time consuming and maybe can't get there quick enough. So do you think DER, is there merit or value from your experience and the work that you've done, is it doable in the scale that's required going forward? Like what are the steps that need yeah. to be considered? Yeah. No, really good question. So I think John worded what a DER is very well. And I, I wanna say it very simply. So when we think of the grid, which is what most of our listeners are probably connected to. If you currently don't have anything like solar or a generator or things like that, you're connected to the grid. And the grid is a large scale power. Now, let's say you wanted to make your own energy and you no longer wanted to be connected to the grid or you wanted you know, another asset that you can manage. That's what we're talking about when we say distributed energy resources. So you're now becoming your own power producer. And the thing with DRs is I do think there is merit but I do think what the industry lacks the most is experts in the DER industry and knowledge on what it takes to implement DER. Now we can sit here in this episode and say DERs are great and they are great. I think the problem is there is so much more detail and coordination that DERs require. So There are two things that you can do, and we kind of were going to talk about them later, but I'll mention them right now. There's grid connected DRs and there's off grid connected DRs. And depending what route you take, it's going to be a different ballgame. So grid connected DRs, you need to talk to your utility about, you know, tying in your asset into their system. So now we are talking about, okay, I went and I purchased a generator and now I want to call up my utility and I want to tell them, hey, can I connect my asset into your system? That is a very complicated process currently. Can it be made easier? Of course. Is it an easy process? No, you are trying to connect something to a large scale utility. If connected wrong, you could shut down an entire system. It's a very crucial and important thing. Now, if you're doing it on the sense where, you know, you are powering yours off grid and you're just managing it in your system, you need to have that knowledge on how to operate power you're now becoming your power supplier. And oftentimes companies that are installing DRs are not in the energy industry. You know, they're automotive, they're industrial, they're commercial, they're a school, things like that. So you've now added on a new level of expertise to your role. And that's where I think it does get complicated. I do think DRs are a great solution. I've seen the designs, I think they work. I do think oftentimes we focus too much on the fact that the designs work. And I think that's out of the question. The designs are there, they can work. It's about managing the system and actually implementing the system. Okay, great, great answer. And thank you for that. I threw you for a loop. And so I'll get back on course on. So John and Lysandra, again, you guys both experienced in this. Can you talk about some of the types of DER that are in the marketplace and and maybe in, in the future in the marketplace too? 
Well, Miss Sandra, you go. Yeah, I think, so let's talk about what we see every day. So in my neighborhood, when I take a walk, there's a few houses that have solar panels on the roof. That's a DER. Some people are, you know, looking to use their electric vehicle as, you know, they're looking to use that battery to power their house backwards. That's a DER. Those are a little bit more things on the smaller scale that you can see. But if we're talking the commercial or industrial scale, you'll see things like generators. So natural gas generators, diesel generators, in the future, potentially biogas generators, something involved with hydrogen. So we have that aspect. We also have things like windmills now being used. So wind power, some organizations, if they have the space, they decide to install wind power and operate off of that. And that's also a, a category of DER. John, I don't know if I'm missing a few. I'm sure I am. I think you're touching on the main points there. Basically, what I think what we're saying is anything that you could install that will generate electrical power could be a DER. But I think you've made an interesting comment on vehicles because there is this whole point that electric vehicle batteries could not just power the house. They could be putting power back in the, generally in the network or acting as part of the storage. So I think whereas 10 years ago, we would not have talked about batteries as being part of a DER solution. I think nowadays, I think we do have to talk about them very much. They are also, if you're looking for a, a DER solution for yourself, for example, based on solar panels, but you've got 24 hour usage, then batteries are going to provide a, a degree of, you know, sort of, they're going to enable you to use power when the sun's not shining, because we know so many people, their criticism of renewable energy is it's not consistent. But when you add battery, or let's, let's say when you add storage to an intermittent renewable resource, you can overall have a much more reliable resource. So that does become a key component. It's interesting because I think lots of people have deployed some form of DER, but not called it that way. A number of people have done cogeneration. That's another good example of a resource. But I, I want to pick up on a point you made earlier with, if you like, the UK European view on this. And that is the big question is, do you make it to suit your operation or are you looking to become an exporter of power? Now, one of the reasons why being an exporter of power has become worth looking at in many jurisdictions is because of what you were being paid for that power. So if there was a feed in tariff type arrangement, it could make the difference between your resource being not economic or having, you know, a sort of a short payback or a long payback. But one of the things that we're finding, and wind is a good example of it, if you're looking at onshore, onshore wind, mm -hmm. you can be in a location where you've got a great wind resource, but you're right at the far end of, of a distribution leg that can't take the power that you want to put into the system. So you would have to redesign that, that wind turbine or wind farm on the basis of what you can put into the system. And I'm just going to throw a question, you know, we're going all off track today. I'm going to throw a question in for us. What we all know, I think, and we haven't actually said here, there has to be a fundamental root and branch review of distribution and an investment in an improved distribution system if DER is going to work. So the question is, who pays for that upgrading of the grid ah okay so geez john you have thrown us for a little bit of a loop here but i'll answer that Why not? <laughs> yeah so Sandra had mentioned this typically what happens is you actually have to pay for a study to evaluate even if it's even possible based on where they're connected and then again depending on the size of the installation sometimes the utility will pay for it, sometimes the customer has to pay for the upgrade and it's it's not cheap from my experience we've been involved in a couple throughout the country that that it would vary depending on the utility and where you're located in that utility and they all have as the sender said they have different rules so you have to actually understand that that that's from my experience on that piece do you want to add anything i do i think it comes down to when are we talking, you know, like if we're talking 2022, I want to install a DR. Okay, well, is your utility able to provide you with that power? Yes. So to me, why would your utility pay for it? 
Now, if we're talking in 2030, and right now we all depend on our utilities to provide us with the power, but in 2030, they're no longer capable of meeting customer demand. In my opinion, it's almost their fault we have to install DRs. It's the grid's fault that we need external resources to do this because it's the influx in electricity usage will be because of government mandates. So things like EVs, that's going to cause an influx, which reduces our availability to power. Well, that, that mandate was put forward by the government. So in my opinion, they almost should be covering that. But you know, that's kind of how I think. I just think of right now it's available to me. So if I decide that I want to power it myself, that is a choice I made. But when it's no longer available to me because of changes, I just don't think I should have to pay for it. So valid points. I wanted to come back to John and it still relates to what you're saying. We, we have a couple customers that we know, one in Ontario that actually, John, they actually put generators in to actually sell power. And this is a large greenhouse and they're using the heat, but they get paid. And in fact, they, they like it so much that they would like to do more of that. And then we have a organization in California, another large hundred acre greenhouse, mm -hmm. but there's a shortage of power in California. So again, they're using the power when they need it. And if they don't need it, they sell it to the utility. And, and what's interesting is the rules and regulations on um, what the customer has to pay for. Even though Lysandria said, you know, it's beneficial to the utility, at least in the case in California, they are very rigid on what has to be done and how you have to pay for stuff. So it's, yeah. I think it has a lot to do with legacy on rules and regulations that utilities have followed. And I, I think in the future, this has to change and be modified to make it more readily accessible or easier to do, as you said at the beginning. Can I throw something at you then? I'm, I'm just going to make a, a statement. We can argue about it later, but we could say, <laughs> and I think it's the same for the UK and Canada, the current electricity grid is not fit for purpose, i.e. when you look at the future purpose that it needs to be there. On that basis, is this not something that everybody should pay for? Should we perhaps have a levy per kilowatt hour that goes to fund the rebuilding of the grid? What do you think? I think it's important to define what role the grid plays. So okay. if we think that the, the grid is supposed to provide us with power, then to me, that gives them responsibility. If it's that we as consumers are responsible for paying for a system that can provide us with power, then we are responsible for the cost. I really just think it depends on who is the responsibility with, what have we been paying for right now? What's built into our rates? Do we pay for you know, grid integrity? Do we pay for expansions and things like that? And changing what we already pay for will require a, a huge shift in the energy culture. Completely, totally agree. Okay, I'm staying with what we're at, but I'm going back on track with our questions, but again, slightly modifying it. So here's the question for you guys, because we've all been involved in organizations that are looking at DR, but some go, I just want to go completely off grid. And some go, nope, no, I just want to supplement my current because I can't get enough power from the grid or it's cheaper to go the other option. Question for you guys from, from your experience, What's the pros and cons for distributed energy to go on the grid versus going off the grid? What are the challenges associated with that? If you can share from your experience of doing such a thing, because you'll hear people, I see new people go, no, I'm just going to go off the grid. And I don't know if they really understand the repercussions or behind that. So if you guys could share your experience, the did you want to take, take a stab at this first? Sure. I think if you're going off grid, you need to be able to 100% manage your system and understand how your system works. So when you're off grid, you're solely responsible for your power. There's no connection to anyone. You are managing it. You are maintaining it. You're doing all of that. Now with grid connected, there's a bit of support from your utility. If you have excess power, you're able to send it back to the grid. So it goes somewhere. If you're off grid, you need to figure out if you need a battery, you need to figure out how to make sure your system doesn't overload and you don't blow your entire electrical system. So I would say to me, those are the two key points. If you don't think you're able to manage your own system, 
I don't think off grid is the solution for you. And by that, I mean, you could hire externally, you could do it internally. I just mean you need to be able to either employ someone to manage it for you or have someone on site to manage it for you. Yeah, I think you've touched on a really important point there that an awful, when you get up to large scale DER, you are looking at running a small power station, should we say, and that's not normally within the scope of many organisations. But I just wanted to reflect on the fact that a lot of people who go distributed actually maintain a grid connection and are then looking at the, the DER being something over and above. And I think Dave touched on it, and I've certainly had it with some companies I've worked with, where where they are on the existing grid, the capacity is not there for the process that they want, and the cost of getting the grid reinforced doesn't look so good against putting in your own capacity on site. But then you've got this interesting issue, even if you're not, should we say, feeding back into the grid, how do you manage your distribution on site when part of your feed is coming from the grid and part of your feed is coming from your distributed resource? And it gets back to where you were going on this, Lysandra. If those two systems are interconnected, then there's a whole raft of regulation and protocols that you have to follow. Of course, one of the things you can do is be completely separate and have an operation that's running off your DER, and then you don't have to worry about the codes, the connections, or, or, or what else. The other one I just flashed into my mind was something I came across a, a little while back, where in the UK, there was a, a, an option for what was a, a DER that you would not necessarily think about to start with, and that is, if you have a standby generator plant, on site, putting this under the control of the utility for them to use for peak lopping. Now, this is not a particularly environmentally sound one, because typically when this program was on, it was a diesel generator. But with that, you then had to have the situation that your standby generating plant had to be up to the standards that the utility wanted. You had to then give them complete control. So I think I think where we are on this is there is a big issue to consider between grid and off grid or mixing the supplies you know it's simpler if you keep it separate but if you want to maximize your opportunities you probably need to be integrated i, I do want to stress uh, for our listeners though when you're looking at either on or off the grid you really have to have a good understanding of how you use energy every hour to figure out oh. your plant size and how it operates, which John, I don't know if, from your experience, not many customers truly understand their usage pattern or what drives it. And, and that's the first place to start for sure. A few years back, I was talking to an organization that wanted to install cogeneration and they had done nothing on energy management beforehand. And the problem was that the way they were looking at this, they thought, that they could install a four megawatt plant. Because it was combined heat and power, the heat was the restricting factor. When they researched the heat and what they could use, they ended up putting in a 250 kilowatt plant because they wouldn't <laughs> be able to do something with the heat. And I think we should have had a health and safety warning at the beginning of this episode don't even look at DER until you know really exactly how you use energy, when, how, what quantities. If you haven't got that understanding, you're probably going to make a mistake with DER. Okay. When would you choose to be grid connected? What's the thing that drives that decision making, Lysander? So when I think of DERs, I think it's almost a step-by-step -step process. And we've kind of mentioned the steps throughout the episode, but I guess to put it in chronological order, this is my personal opinion, by the way, I think first you need to define the purpose of DERs. So why are you installing a DER? Is it to power your facility? So is it to sell back to the grid? Do you want it to be a, a monetary thing? Once you outline your purpose, you can then decide when you want to be grid connected or if you want to be off grid connected. So to me, you would be grid connected when you want to give power back to the grid, when you're okay with your excess power going elsewhere and not storing it for yourself. That's a time where you would be grid connected. And once you define the purpose, I think then it's 
you need to look at your own energy consumption and analyze how you use your energy. From there, you can then determine what type of DR best suits your needs. So for instance, if, you, if your peak hours, let's say, are when the sun's out, that's when you use the most electricity, maybe solar is a good option. If your peak hour of consumption is not when the sun's out, maybe something like generation is more up your alley. So analyzing that will be very crucial in determining what type of DR. I think oftentimes people jump in with, I want to install this kind of DR, and then they don't think about how it complements their operation. From there, I also think you need to consider size, like John mentioned. Size is very crucial. Oftentimes people oversize their DRs, and if you're oversizing your DR and you're also off-grid, you're then going to have a lot of excess power. Um, and it's honestly just a bunch of wasted money when you think of it that way. There's nowhere for you to put it. You've you know, spent extra capital on getting this bigger size DER, and ultimately you're not using that power for anything. Now, if you oversize and you're connected to the grid, sometimes that has benefits of, let's say, you may choose to oversize because you actually make a lot of money selling to the grid, and then in some jurisdictions, being grid connected, you don't make too much money because the sell selling rate isn't too high. So there's a lot of factors to consider. And I think it's really about what are you trying to do with your DER? And once you determine that, you can kind of see all the steps at play. Also, what we haven't mentioned is if you are grid connected, you need to talk to your utility to see if you can even connect to the grid. Some areas are already maxed out. For instance, your utility may not have anywhere for you to connect to because they're already at capacity. Very good. John, is there anything you want to add to what Lysandra yeah, said? Yeah, I, I think just a couple of points. I think that was really good stuff there. I agree with what you're saying there. I think the other thing about grid and off-grid can be, funny enough, is the size. Because what you might be doing is looking at a particular size of DER and then discover it might double your costs if you're getting that up to the to standard that you can connect to the grid. So I think that's a factor. And I think we shouldn't miss out, and I don't think we've mentioned it so far, another reason driver for DER may be it's part of your carbon transition and that what you're looking at is that you, you've maximised your energy efficiency, you've bought whatever you can in low carbon grid supplies you've got something left you want to do that's an option that you then start looking at a low carbon or renewable based der so something that i think we all on, on this call think that dr is the future but it, and you've heard that it's not a simple process but there's going to be a variety of players in the market we know that there's actually suppliers that will go in and say look we'll put the plant in for you whether it's cogen or whatever we own it and you pay yeah. us to actually operate and and that seems pretty simple because you know it may not be your core business what's the pros and cons of going that route relying on third party actually being the provider for the distributed energy resources for clients. What would your thoughts be on that? I think that's a very valid point. And I can remember a good few, few years back, I did a paper for one of the professional institutes on looking at, at the issues about do you go a third party route or do, do, do you do it yourself? And I think the simple thing is, if you have the skills and you have the capital then there's a very good case for doing it yourself because you should be able to make more money out of it because if a third party can do it, make a profit and give you an advantage, there, there's some meat in that sandwich there. But if you haven't got the skills and you haven't got the money, then yes, going to a third party provider has to be a good option. What I am going to say though, from my experience of having seen people who have gone to a third party provider, you really need to look very carefully at the service level agreement that you've got. Because if you don't get that right, you will find that you're not getting anywhere near the benefit that you expect. I know of a hospital that had a cogeneration plant and they had a penalty if they weren't taking the power from it. But if the plant went down, the provider didn't get penalised for not providing power. Um, and it sounds a bit obvious, but it's the kind of thing, it's almost sometimes it looks too good to be true. And again, 
you haven't got the expertise, so you're gone to this third party. I think there's a strong case if you've not got the expertise, you need some expert advice, an intermediary, a third party to help you negotiate or review the deal with the provider of that DER. Yeah, I think in this case, I would treat it as that third party is now your new utility. So you need to take a look at your current utility and think, you know, are you in a regulated utility space or a non-regulated utility yeah. space? What's nice about being in a regulated utility space is, you know, it is monitored. Some You can't have spikes in costs and things like that because they regulate yeah. that for us customers. So if you're in that space and then you decide to take the third party route and let's say inflation increases a ton, you may see that rate change, whereas yeah. those connected to their regulated utility may not. So it, it's really more complicated than just considering a third party versus non because you've now entered other factors as well it's not just pay someone and get it done you actually really need to understand what that contractual language is what you're on the hook for how you exit like it quite frankly it's a partnership and sometimes partnerships don't go well and so you need to make sure you've got a, a way to exit that is reduces your risk and then here's the other thing i want to say because we've been saying this in our podcast customers frequently don't really understand utilities or utility costs. When you're entering with a third party, you really need to understand your current cost and future costs and the, and the costs of them selling it to you versus what you can buy in the grid. And again, that's not truly understood by most customers. So I think having a third party evaluating that would be really helpful. I think L Lissandra's nailed it. When you go to that third party provider of a DER, it's like you have another utility but the complication is the utility is using your real estate as well. So it's even more so. And your point about the regulation is so true. It's so true. If you're in a regulated environment, you know what's going to happen. Truth is, if you have a look at the, the agreement that you're going to sign with a third party provider, it's all buried in there somewhere as to what's going to happen. But you actually have to go through it with a fine tooth comb. Yeah, and Sorry. I think a lot of times people turn to DRs because they think their utility is changing price on them just because they want to. That's not the case, especially in a regulated industry. You know, if prices are changing, there is a reason for it. You can read online and see what caused that price change. Typically, they send you a notice as to why that price change is there. The difference with third party is you kind of almost lose out on that formality of price change, I would say. But again, it really just depends where you're located. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think we're at the end of our session here. And I thank you both for your comments and input. So I'll start with John, what, what would be the biggest takeaway for our listeners based on what we had discussed today? DERs are something that you should look at and understand. But before you do that, you should look at and understand how you use electricity at the moment, how you pay for it. If you're not up to speed on that, then really you would be wasting your time with DERs. That said, I think looking forward 10, 20 years, I think we're going to see a much bigger uptake of DERs and they are going to be part of our, our future, if you like, blended supply picture. Yeah, I would say DRs are the future. That's point blank. That That's what it is. Now, your opinion behind it, it's going to vary. You can see here, like, we all pretty much agree. But for instance, my opinions on why we need DRs could be seen as a little bit rogue. It really is just about your understanding and your experience of the energy industry. So my last piece is, I think I agree with you. DERs will be the future. And I think because of all the things that you guys have said, clients are gonna to have to be a lot more knowledgeable about what their energy requirements and what they need in the future, not only for costs, but also in this transition. So I think we're gonna make, the market's gonna to have to be a lot more involved and the end users are gonna to have to be a lot more involved in the market like they've never done before. And I think that's actually a good thing. So thank you both for your input today. And Lysander, I'm gonna, hand this off to you. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on our DR Basics episode. Have a great day. That's all for today's episode of the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast. Thanks for listening. 
Make sure to check us out on our website at 360energy.net and follow us on LinkedIn at 360 Energy Inc. Tune in to our podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Anchor, or other listening platforms by searching the 360 on Energy and Carbon. You can watch the video recording and subscribe on YouTube at 360 Energy Inc. Email us your feedback at podcast at 360energy.net or comment on our LinkedIn posts. See you next week.